For the PCR test, a swab is inserted all the way to the back of each nostril. Those taking this test usually have to wait a day or two for their results. And let's check out its high sensitivity and specificity rate. Now, sensitivity is the test's ability to identify those affected as positive, while specificity is the ability to identify those not affected as negative. As for the antigen rapid test, it has a sensitivity rate of 82% lower than the PCR test. Now, this test is done by inserting a swab around 2.5 centimeters up each nostril, and results usually take only 15 to 30 minutes. Well, on October 29th, National University of Singapore spin-off Breathonics said it was in discussions with the health ministry to deploy breathalyzer-type tests in trials at public locations. With this one, a person simply breathes into a tube connected to a specialised machine. Results take even quicker, a minute or even less. The ART and breathalyzer-type test are less accurate than a PCR one, which has been described as the gold standard of COVID-19 detection. So with many COVID-19 tests currently being used, perhaps it's worth to recap what each test is for. So joining me now is Professor Dale Fisher from the Yong Lulin School of Medicine. He's also a senior consultant at the National University Hospital. Welcome back, Professor. So the PCR test, the antigen rapid test and the breath test, could you briefly describe what each is best used for? Uh, sure, Olivia. Thanks for having me back. Uh, the main test is the is the PCR, right? So mm -hmm. this is a polymerase chain reaction. It can identify bits of genetic material from the virus, and it amplifies that up. So it's very sensitive. In fact, it's it's our gold standard. It's it's sensitive and specific. So these are other words for saying it's accurate. In in general, if it's positive, then you can believe it's positive, and in general, if it's negative, you can believe it's negative. So that's the PCR. Mm -hmm. The antigen, it's, uh, it's got some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it doesn't amplify, it just detects the antigen. So, so therefore it's going to be less sensitive. Some say around 80% sensitive. So that's quite good. But if it's very important to detect everyone that's positive, then obviously 80% might not be good enough for you. But it has some advantages. It doesn't require a lab. So in remoter parts of the world or underdeveloped countries where they may not be able to do a PCR, they can do this. It's also point of care. So this is why some people are doing it at airports and things like that, because uh, it's been likened to a pregnancy test and, and you don't need the laboratory. You don't need the, the skilled staff to be trained. So they're the main two diagnostic tests. Um, you did mention breathalyzer. Um, so, so this is, uh, I'm, I must say, I don't know much about this. I haven't seen any data or, or publications, but it's certainly been, uh, looked at in, in Singapore, uh, I think in an experimental sense, uh, the plan is, is that you could just blow, uh, the, the test will pick up what's called volatile organic compounds and the result is in less than a minute. So it, it's exactly like doing a, an alcohol breathalyzer where there are, compounds that it can pick up and it can tell you and perhaps even quantify um, whether you've got virus. But I'm, I'm afraid it's not being used now. Uh, I don't know the sensitivity and specificity, but um, it, it'd be a dream test uh, if it was very sensitive and specific and, and so easy that anyone could do it and get a result in less than a minute. That's like the holy grail, I guess. I see. Well, Professor, of course, you know, accuracy and speed, those are the two main criteria, perhaps, that a COVID-19 test should have. So as companies develop their own tests, what considerations do the authorities uh, bear in mind in the proliferation of such tests in the market? We want it to be easy. We want it to be reliable. Uh, we want it to be something we can depend upon. We'd like it to be cheap. Um, but most importantly, I think it's remember that it's not just one thing. It, it's the in, it's what you do with the test result. So here's a bad scenario. Uh, you go and have your test. Uh, it comes back positive. You don't find out for a few days. So you've already been not isolating. And then if you don't quarantine yourself anyway, then you could say, well, the whole testing process is, is flawed. So it, it needs to be part of a system of, of good 
uh, result giving, getting those those results back to the person, good instruction and, and enforcement uh, of that instruction to make sure that people that are positive are truly isolated. So don't just think about testing as uh, as as the key. It's it's one of several tools that we can use to 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 fight against COVID. We just heard earlier today that the Changi Air Cargo Hub is ready to uh, distribute, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine when it reaches Singapore. So when that happens, what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity, Professor? Well, herd immunity, rather than thinking about how many people are vaccinated, it's better to think about how many people are immune. Uh, now we're talking about 90, 95% success rate. So if we want 90, if we want 70% of the community to be immune and, and it's say 90% effective, then clearly we need 80% to be vaccinated. Um, but we need to, to remember that we still don't know how long this lasts for. And you could have herd immunity. And if the vaccine does wear off, then we've got a, a, a situation where, where the herd is no longer immune. So, so this is my greatest concern at the moment. So the answer to your question is probably around 80%. But, but, I, but I think the, how long the, the vaccine lasts for is a question we still don't have the answer to. Uh, we will learn more through 2021. And don't get me wrong, 2021 is going to be a lot um, easier, I believe, to manage than, than 2020. Uh, I believe the vaccine's safe because because most uh, side effects uh, would occur in that first six or eight weeks. But but the the duration of the effectiveness to me is one of the biggest questions. What should Singapore be doing now? As as you mentioned, Changi, but but the whole cold chain uh, as it arrives in Singapore, as it goes to uh, distribution centres, whether they be in 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 primary care or in in hospitals or, or other community centres. Uh, this can all be planned now, that cold chain, how we're going to data manage uh, who's had the vaccine, who needs their second dose three or four weeks later. We need a communications plan. How are we going to help the community understand uh, that it is safe uh, and that it, that it will work and, and it'll help us to return to normal? So communication plans are important. So, so Singapore is in a lucky position. We're we're not uh, seeing seeing um, massive spread like we see in other uh, in other countries around the world. So, I think we've got a, a little bit of time to to not panic and and get the plan really really well in place so that we can do it do it properly. Right. Well, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me, Professor. That was Professor Dale Fisher from the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at NUS.